Seasonic, the heart of your system. I'm Neil Water for Kit Guru. This motherboard is the Super O from Supermicro C9Z390PGW. Their model codes, you can break them down, they mean something. So C for desktop rather than workstation or server. 9 socket R, that's the uh, Coffee Lake Intel Coffee Lake uh, socket. Z390, obviously Intel chipset. PG for pro gaming, we're going to come back to that because that's a big part of this review. And W for Wi Fi, because it's got Wi Fi. A little while ago, I reviewed this C7Z370 CGIW motherboard, uh, Z370 rather than Z390, and I for Mini ITX. Uh, interesting motherboard, it uses uh, VRM hardware by Monolithic Power. I had not come across that make before. Really good hardware. BIOS was a bit uh, of a curiosity. They do their own thing, does uh, Supermicro, they have their way of working. And basically it worked okay. Uh, so that was interesting. Then my colleague Ryan uh, reviewed the Mini ITX Z390 and lo and behold they'd changed stuff. The exact opposite of what we say about most motherboard manufacturers where they kind of copy and paste designs. You can sometimes basically look at a board and not really be clear if it's Ryzen or uh, Intel because the VRMs and such like they're the same. The layout is so similar. In the case of Supero, Supermicro, they changed stuff. So the VRMs, instead of being monolithic on that Z390, were by Infineon, Infineon Primarian to be uh, exact. And along came this ATX board and <laughs> Infineon Primarian. So this is a bigger version of the board that Ryan had reviewed. It has extra power stages, which makes sense because, you know, more hardware you can expect to overclock an ATX board, whereas a mini ATX, meh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and then there are two interesting features. We've got a PLX chip uh, to support loads of PCI Express for these four graphic slots. We've also got 10 gigabit Ethernet, which is a surprise on a gaming board. Uh, ASRock started using 2.5G on some of their boards, sort of bumping up the 1 gigabit to 2.5 gigabit. Fair enough. Uh, you don't want your Ethernet uh, trailing behind your, uh, wire, uh, your wireless, after all. Uh, so, on the face of it, this is a gaming board. You've got the RGB, as you can see. And it's got loads of graphics support. And it's got big Ethernet. We've got four graphics slots and a PLX chip to supply PCI Express to those slots. Uh, but we have no official support for SLI. There is no branding on the box whatsoever about that, which uh, is like, huh, then what's the point of multiple graphics slots? Yes, DX12 means you can mix and match graphics, but that's not the same thing. We have three areas of RGB under the shroud over the IO, so it's coming up through the Super o logo. On the, the chipset uh, heatsink, there's a sort of a perspex or acrylic cover on that, which is RGB. And then underneath the board, most of the RGB actually seems to be under the board. Six SATA ports laid down, two U.2. Why do we need U.2, folks? Over here we have the main power connector. Around the head of the board we have one 8-pin EPS. With the power turned off, the RGB obviously goes, including on that Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB, which are really bright LEDs. And we can see we've got some really chunky aluminium heat sinks on the VRMs, and also a chunky aluminium heat sink on the that PLX chip above the main graphics slot. The four graphics slots are evenly spaced. They're mechanically all times 16. However, you have not got enough PCI Express to feed all four with 16. Essentially, they're in two pairs. So uh, 16 and 16, if you like, or 16, 8, 8, or 8, 8, 8, 8, or however you choose to do it. Uh, evenly spaced, therefore, if you want to put two graphics cards in logically, it's these two slots here. Put a, a dual slot card in this uh, slot here, it'll be crammed up against this one here. Anyway, that's the graphics hardware. Here we have the heat sinks over the SSDs. Those heat sinks come off, revealing in this instance the 1WD black SSD. The uh, fitting screws, fastening screws for the heat sink also hold down the SSD. So as soon as the heat sink comes off, bump, the SSD pops up. Uh, there's a thermal interface between the chipset heatsink and the SSD heatsink. So even though it's three separate parts, thermal pads to the SSDs, they kind of connect together so the whole thing acts as one. The rear I.O. is actually a tad peculiar. We've got a PS2, which we're familiar with from overclocking boards because PS2 will work come hella high water, whereas USB can break at high clock speeds sometimes. 
we've got two USB 3.0s, a pair of display ports. What? Here we have an HDMI. What? Uh, obviously, that's the connection points for the wireless AC. There we have audio. Here we have a load of USB, uh, and we've also got your two Ethernets. So we've got you know, two USB 3s there, uh, three USB 3.1s, a Type A, and one Type C. So the USB, not bad, but why, you may wonder, those display outputs. And then across the foot of the board, we have headers for more USB. So one Type C there, uh, two USB 3.0s there, and a couple of USB 2s. You'll note there are no USB 2s on the, the uh, rear I.O. So if your case happens to support uh, USB 2s, there you go. Or some sort of internal connection for uh, an AIO, something like that. Other features of note, we have micro buttons for power reset and also for clear CMOS there. Down the bottom, we have uh, this uh, postcode debug display, which is somewhat tucked away, but just about visible. A number of fan headers, so one up by the uh, 8 pin EPS, one here that's specifically labeled as 12 volt pump, i.e. high power. Another one there, another one there. Another one there, and then one tucked right in there by the IO shield close to the rear. There are no fan headers on the bottom of the board, which is not the end of the world, but it's sometimes handy to have one down there if you say bring your fan in from the front of the case to the foot of the board. Uh, we also have two RGB headers. They're both 12 volt rather than addressable. So basically we've got everything that we require for a high-end PC. They could have maybe sprinkled one or two more features on it, but it's pretty solid. One curiosity we noted on the back of the motherboard is this JTAG connector here, uh, which is a connector that they plug into at the factory just to test the board is all good. Uh, and here's the thing, if you use an Acetec uh, hold down bracket on the back of the board, which is a fairly conventional thing to do, it just fouls the JTAG. Now we've used this particular Acetec, it's a Fractal Design Celsius S24, used it with a whole bunch of motherboards and have never had an issue with it. Uh, so whether this is that uh, Fractal Stroke Acetec has uh, mucked it up uh, technically or whether it's that Supro has infringed on a keep out area, don't know. But uh, using this whole down bracket on this board ideally, I'd cut that corner off the uh, of the bracket so it just clears the uh, JTAG. Uh, not ideal and slightly surprising to see that. And here we have the board stripped down minus all the heat sinks and all the furniture. So we've got the Z390 chipset from Intel. There we have the Aquantia 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, chip there. That uh, heat sink is stuck in place. I ain't touching that. That's the PLX chip. Here we have the VRM. So that's 6 by 50 amps for the uh, V core and 2 by 40 amps for the SOC. Core i9 9900K, BIOS is set completely stock except XMP is enabled. I'm going to run Cinebench R20. I'm looking for a score close to 5000, 4800, 4900 would be nice. Click on run, system kicks off, clock speed turbos up 4.78 gigahertz all cores, settling down now 4.7 all, right bang on 4.7 gigahertz. All eight cores, happy, 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 100% loaded, brilliant, steaming along nicely. And then drops to 2.7 gigahertz. And then we wait for the score to come in. You will note Cinebench R20 takes considerably longer to run than the R15, which is uh, an advantage of a newer test. The old one was just over in a snap of a finger. This takes about three times longer than R15. And the score, 3,359, so way shy of where I was expecting it to be. Just reset the clocks there, start that running again. As before, initial turbo settles down 4.7 gigahertz. Now let's scroll down to power draw. Temperatures are absolutely negligible, 60 odd degrees. And here we have the point which is that the CPU package power draw 95 watts. Two point seven gigahertz there. 95 watts there. Let's just quit that. Right, 
reset the uh, clocks. So CPU package is negligible at the moment, seven watts because it's just ticking over, dropping to six at idle. Run. Initially we have up, 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 50, 112, 164, 163, and we keep an eye on that. And about halfway through the test, now this power's coming down, and now we're down to 95 watts. And that's what's going on here. Out of the box, we get an initial turbo boost, and then with a heavy intensive CPU load, the power gets pulled back to 95 watts. If we go in the bars, we can see what's going on. The explanation for the bizarre behaviour of the CPU is really straightforward. That is how the CPU is supposed to work, because SuperO, Supermicro, believes Intel. Intel says 95 watt TDP. They base their figures, their performance, their voltage and such like on the power draw of the CPU. So 95 watts plus a percentage for turbo. If we go into advanced mode and we go to CPU overclocking, so default manual and there we have the uh, turbo speed. So all cores will go to 47, up to two cores uh, 50, i.e. 5 gigahertz. So uh, 5, 4.9, 4.8, 4.7, it's a cascade of speeds. However, you've also got the business about power and time. And this is something that in the past wasn't really a factor because quad core processors, they could turbo all day long. Six cores, slightly more tricky. Eight cores, they require more care and attention. So here we have the thing, power limit override. This is the thing we saw with the mini ITX boards previously. So we do have some explanatory notes in the bias, but they are like an aid memoir for someone that understands what the heck is going on behind the scenes. So in this instance, power limit one override is disabled. Over here it says, if it's disabled, the BIOS will program default values. So disabled means default. And it's both a time and power thing. As you saw initially, the processor happily turbos to 4.7, and then it dropped like a stone because Cinebench R20 is a particularly heavy workload. If we enable that, and you will now see the number is 95000, because they work in milliwatts. That's actually 95 watts. If I change that to, Let's call it 150, so 150,000, which doesn't feel right. And you don't enter to enter the number, you just simply go to the next option. The uh, power limit time window is how long it's going to run for. So if you do like a really bursty test like Cinebench R15 these days, you can actually be entirely within that time window, uh, which can be <laughs> highly um, distorting. And then we'll leave power limit 2, which is the initial, initial bursty thing, we'll leave that at 210 uh, because we're not troubled about that for the moment. Save, then we get the BPT BPT because this is a very noisy motherboard. I've heard that beeping a lot in the past few days. Same test as before. As before, initial turbo 4.8 gigahertz drop into 4.7, which is what we expect to see. And then the question is gonna be, what happens? And there we go, blue screen. So my rough and ready bump up the power limit to not a crazy number, uh, clearly did not work. Now actually when I've been doing some experimentation with this board what I discovered was that 150 watts is actually a little bit uh, cavalier. If you pick a figure such as 125 watts it's probably fine. In other words give it more juice than 95 but not too much. But this is just trying to get the thing just to turbo to its correct speed out of the box. I'm not trying to do anything clever here. Okay let's go for plan B. Uh, so I've reset the power limit back to disabled so we're now on default as we now understand it cpu profile default uh, advanced cpu oc setting is manual let's pick a profile let's pick five gigahertz okay do nothing else just five gigahertz okay back in windows so i'm on a five gigahertz profile uh, it's running at five gigahertz at the moment but that doesn't mean anything there's no load we start cinebench r20 running five gigahertz CPU package, 210 watts at the moment. 180, 160, here. Yeah. If we 
we go to the clock speed, we are at 3.5 gigahertz, 3.4 gigahertz, depending on which cores we're looking at. Call it three and a half gigahertz for round money and 160 watt CPU package power. So obviously the CPU package power and voltage and such like that's all been adjusted within that five gigahertz uh, default profile. However, that five gigahertz profile quite clearly bears no relation to the speed at which the processor is actually running on all cores in Cinebench R20. And even if we make an allowance for an AVX offset of 300 megahertz, we're still nowhere near. So we're doing considerably better than out of the box, but that speed, that's junk. But clearly that is a considerable improvement over the out of the box uh, initial score. CPU performance out of the box of this board, not good because it throttles like crazy. Having said that, it is worth noting that many tasks, uh, plenty of games actually, and things like 3D Mark Firestrike are not massively CPU intensive, they're more graphics intensive. Uh, so if you throw a proper CPU intensive task such as Cinebench R20 or indeed Blender at this motherboard, out of the box performance is abysmal because of the power cap. As you saw, unlock the power. If you're uh, careful about it, you can be okay. If you're a bit rash, blue screen. Uh, engage an overclocking profile preset. So in this instance, it was five gigahertz. It didn't give me five gigahertz, but it gave me something. We'll come to proper overclocking in just a moment. But before that, graphics. So here we have a pair of RTX 2080 graphics cards. There we have a four slot uh, bridge from NVIDIA. Here we have the three slot bridge that I've uh, also used with MSI and Gigabyte boards just to confirm that uh, SLI does indeed work correctly with these cards. Uh, here we have proof that no, this board does not support SLI. And as an observation, these bridges are 75 quid a piece, which seems like money for old rope for NVIDIA. So no, you cannot do SLI with this board. You can do multiple graphics cards, but not SLI. Overclocking i9 9900K on the Super O, here we go. So we change the CPU profile from default to performance. We change uh, the profile here. We're gonna pick 5.2 gigahertz and then immediately change the speed to 5.1 gigahertz. Uh, when you select a CPU OC setting profile, it uh, changes a bunch of settings behind the scene, so we want uh, some slightly more extreme than the 5.1 would give us, but we don't want to go faster than 5.1 because of this process that don't work too well. Okay, AVX uh, ratio offset, I've set that to three. Uh, there are some explanatory notes with most motherboards. This would say something like I'd be in 100 megahertz steps and it would probably be minus because it's an offset. So with an AVX workload, this should run at 5.1 minus 300 equals 4.8. Uh, power limit override, let's bump that up to 225. And also there. And that should be okay. Okay, and then we want some voltages. So the system agent voltage, 1.4 is very high. We're millivolts, milliwatts, so um, four figures rather than the usual one decimal place. Uh, we'll change that to 1200 for 1 1.2 volts. We're leaving core voltage on override and we're gonna pick 1.35 rather than 1.45. Really don't like this uh, four figure thing going on. Uh, PCH1075 is fine, IO at 1.2 is fine, LLC, uh, you have options of disabled, one which is strongest, five which is weakest, and auto, instead of four, we want two. And that should be that. Time for Cinebench R20 one more time. So we're currently running at 5.1 gigahertz, obviously with zilch load. And we click on CPU to run. And the speed is indeed 4.8 gigahertz. So that's 5.1 with the AVX offset of 300 equals 4.8. So that's absolutely fine. 
Here we see the CPU package is in the mid 80s. Let's just turn up the fractal cooler, give it a bit of a chance. Should have done that before. CPU package is drawing 195 watts and a little bit 196. Speed is 4.8, which is what we're looking for. And there we go. Cinebench R20 and we have a score just over 5,000. Result. Before I wrap up, I'll just mention in passing the Supero Booster software, which I actually rather like. It gives you a reasonable amount of control over the motherboard in Windows. The one annoyance is it doesn't show power draw, which is why uh, HW Info is uh, such a good utility to use to actually just confirm what's going on with your system. Apart from that, this software allows you to control RGB, check what voltage is going on, change speeds and such, so it does good stuff. This software actually sums up my feelings about this motherboard to a fair extent because the utility is not included on the driver disc that came with the board. We were told that reviewers got relatively early versions of the driver disc, so fine, but when you head off to uh, Supermicro Supero's website, you'll find drivers and BIOS updates for this board, but not that utility. Uh, I did some hunting around. There is indeed an FTP site out there, and when you go there, um, I was given the same link by Supero themselves, and there were something like five different versions of the software on that uh, FTP and you need a later version I mean obviously you always want the late test version but you need a late version for the Windows update 1809 that gives you ray tracing support and all that good stuff so you need a late version and you install it and it doesn't work and then you realize you need a .NET update so you have to install Super O Booster run Windows update which will give you .NET updates for version 3.5 and I think 4 can't really remember and once it's run those and installed those you can then run the software correctly it is a pain that you have to find the software uh, install the software run Windows update then you can use the software quite a bit of work and as I say, that pretty much sums up my attitude to this motherboard after some quite extensive testing. Because I have to say, that overclocking I showed you, it didn't take very long to actually do those few steps. But finding what steps I had to take, that took a while. So let's put some eye candy on. And as Time Spy runs, here's what I reckon. This is an expensive motherboard. It costs about £300. The Mini ITX boards that we reviewed previously, both Ryan and myself, they're like £200. Also quite expensive. This board has loads of competition for less than 300. The Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Master is something like 270, and I like that board a lot. I've also been testing this board for comparison purposes with MSI's Meg Z390 Ace, a similarly priced board that is into the Gigabyte, and that works uh, as well as I'd expect. I'll be reviewing that quite soon. Uh, so you're paying a premium for this board, but then you don't expect to sell very many of them, so it's not a huge shock that you're paying uh, extra for a board that's relatively rare. What do you get in return? That's tricky. The PLX chip, as far as I'm concerned, is useless. If I was buying a motherboard that supported multiple graphics cards, I'd want to be absolutely certain that they were just going to work to maximum effect, and that means SLI. I don't know what uh, Super O Super Micro has to pay NVIDIA for the uh, SLI licensing, but clearly it can't be fortunes, otherwise all the other manufacturers wouldn't support it. Uh, it. It surely can't be as much money as the PLX chip. Those things are notoriously expensive. Even if you didn't get two full slots worth of PCI Express, it would be enough for two gaming graphics cards, I'm sure of it. Anyway, the way they've done it, is just peculiar. Uh, this is a pro gaming PG motherboard, but it doesn't have SLI, but it does have PLX. What's that about? 10 gigabit ethernet, uh, it's a nice bonus, but I'm, I'm not really that fussed about it one way or the other. The performance out of the box is just not good because of the way Supero handles power limits, 95 watts with a, with a boost initially, and then it cuts back. The funny thing is you do not necessarily notice that the processor is being throttled because many uh, applications don't use the processor that effectively. In which case, of course, you shouldn't buy an i9-9900K in the first place. But that's a circular argument. If you're buying the 8-core 16-thread processor, you want it to perform right. That's just common sense. Every other manufacturer, in Supero's view, 
does it wrong by giving too much juice to the processor. I get their point entirely. Nonetheless, if they're going to take that attitude, they could surely at least kind of flag it up and say, warning, this processor is not going to run right unless you change this setting here and then make it a one-click thing. The fact I can engage an overclock profile, as I showed you, but I also have to bump up the power limit in order to get the thing to perform correctly, I find that really frustrating. Those uh, overclocking profiles are... They're no good. They're, they are, they're a starting point. And that says to me the development team at Supero, which is probably tiny. I mean, I, I don't know how many people it is, but I'm going to guess it's absolutely tiny. Uh, it needs help. If uh, Super Micro Supero wants to get into the gaming market, they need their bars just to work. If you engage a, an overclocking profile, it should work. There is, however, a bonus, a benefit, amazingly enough, from that approach, which is because their profiles simply do not work correctly. There's a profile in there 5.5 gigahertz for the i9 9900K, which is just nonsensical. It, you know, there's no chance you can get your processor running that fast. But the idea you engage, say, 5.1, 5.2 gigahertz, and then you change the settings from there, because you're basically forced to change settings to get the thing to work right, it means you actually probably will end up underclocking, under, sorry, undervolting your processor, rather, which actually means that, and here's the really funny thing, the performance I got out of this in the end was perfectly decent, and the temperatures and power draw were really good. Now, the fact of the matter is, had I worked anything like as hard on this review as I did uh, on the Z390 Aorus Master, which frankly just works, you just change a few settings and it works. If I was to go back to that board and undervolt it and uh, keep the clock speeds at the same speed or indeed even higher, I imagine that that board would perform as well. But it, it makes you lazy, that gigabyte, because it works so easily. This board is different. This board, you have to work just to... You have to you cannot use it out of the box as far as I'm concerned. The bias notes are fairly useless. The manual doesn't tell you a great deal either. And of course, the user base is tiny. So the, in the information that's out there is very thin on the ground, particularly with an i9 9900K. If you look around, you find one or two people have done it with a Coffee Lake 8700K. 9900K, not that many people have done it and then told you what they've done. So to get the thing to run at 5.1 gigahertz, AVX offset 4.8, uh, yeah, you're well, you're not on your own now, you've seen what I've done. The end result's actually pretty good. The thing is, I cannot imagine why you go to this extent. Why do you work this hard to make this expensive board work the way it ought to work with a minimum of effort? So overall, it's decent. The hardware is good. It just needs help. The support people really need help to get the bias working such out of the box, it just goes bang. And the sooner that Super Micro Super O drops his nonsensical adherence to Intel's TDP ratings for uh, desktop processors, the better. Or if they have to do it for some reason, some internal workstation -y server ethos thing, if they have to do it, flag it up with a great big dirty button on the thing that just says, click this button, we'll fix it for you. Because for us desktop users, gamers, overclockers, the way they've gone about this thing is completely mental. Absolutely frustrating as crazy. Because when you get down to it, this board has potential. And at the moment, or when it was received, I got almost none of that benefit. With a lot of work, it really delivers. And that's so frustrating. This board is not junk, but initially you might think it is, and that's, that's a real shame. So, this board has huge potential. It needs help in the development side of things. It really does. A decent bias would transform this motherboard. And also make the uh, Super o Booster software easy to find, please, chaps. That's annoying as well. And if you could reduce the price, I'd appreciate it. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, I understand. Thumbs down if you must. Hit the bell button to let you know new videos as they become available. Subscribe. We like subscribers. There's loads of links under this video to other good stuff KitGuru does. I'm your order for KitGuru. This is the Super O C9 Z390 PGW.